OK. So indeed, I'm going to talk about Lefschetz symbols. in our model. And algebraic integrable systems. So there will be some connection to the main theme of the conference, but uh, I would like to stress that, uh, that people who work on mirror symmetry should realize that from the point of view of physics from which this, this uh, symmetry arose, this is just the very basic level of, 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 of the approach to the problem which we actually are interested in. And that's uh, in the models with supersymmetry where typically you have, a, you have a lot of ground states. So mirror symmetry concerns some uh, the, uh, studies the geometry of the space of ground states. And in physics, we don't, in physics around us, we don't see supersymmetry per se. And, and uh, the, uh, the energy of the state we are in is not zero. And so we are, what we're actually interested in are the low-lying states. So the spectrum. So given the quantum mechanical system with the Hamiltonian, we want to learn about the <coughs> about the structure of the low-lying part of the spectrum of, uh, of that model. And one way to study that part of the spectrum is to <coughs> look at the partition function, which is the trace over the Hilbert space of the um, Euclidean time evolution operator as a function of the inverse temperature or, or Euclidean time. And for beta going to infinity, the main contribution to this partition function comes from the lower lying uh, energy states. So if we have, some, have a way of estimating this partition function for large beta, we will learn something about uh, the spectrum of the theory. In addition, you may have a symmetry group which, uh, let's say, preserves the evolution. And so the eigenstates of my Hamiltonian will split in the representations of the uh, group G. And so we, we might be interested in the in the representation uh, theory of the group G on the space of, on the, uh, at the, uh, in each eigenspace. And so to this end, we, we may introduce a twist into this problem, where G is an element of the, um, of the group. And so that will tell me not only the multiplicity of a given eigenvalue, but also the, uh, the, uh, the decomposition of, of the eigenspace into the presentations of the group. So what you need to do, you need to decompose the, uh, this eigenspace. So this is the kernel of h hat minus e sub k. Uh, so you, you want to decompose this into irreducible representations. So these are irreps of G. And these are some multiplicity spaces. So to, to know the, these multiplicities, you, uh, again, you look at this function. And then, if you like, you can make a Fourier transform on the group to convolute with the character to extract this multiplicity. Now, in practice, uh, one way people have tried to analyze this uh, partition function is by representing it as a path integral. So 
So this is sometimes can be written formally as an integral over the space of loops. So P is the phase space of a classical mechanical system. with the Hamiltonian H, whose quantization produces the Hilbert space curly H and the operator H hat. And uh, so this partition function will have a form of the integral over the space of loops, of exponential of the uh, I over H bar times the integral over the loop <coughs> in the phase space of the um, of Liouville one form. So this is D inverse of the symplectic form minus uh, the integral from 0 to beta h of p and q dt. So these are parameterized loops. So these are maps uh, of S1 to the phase space, and to avoid the confusion, I will put beta outside, and will I will think of my circle, the source, as being canonic, being the canonical circle R mod Z. So the, the it has a parameter t, which goes between zero and one, and my functions of t are one periodic. Except that uh, in the presence of this twist, I will impose the twisted boundary conditions so here I make, I make an assumption that my symmetry of the quantum system descends from a symmetry of a classical system. It, it's not always the case. Sometimes you have symmetries which you don't see at the classical level and, and vice versa. Sometimes the symmetry which you have at the classical level do not carry over to the quantum case, but let me assume that we are in a simpler situation where G acts on the phase space, preserving the symplectic form and preserving the, the Hamiltonian. Um, so uh, And then there is the formal measure on the space of loops. The precise definition of this measure is the subject of a century-long discussion. So I will not, <laughs> I will not go there because my time is limited. But uh, whatever this measure is, we can try to approach this problem. Is it just for loops in finite dimensional space you have to have some conceptual discussion? Yeah. Because this is not the, uh, if you, if you mm, so what is sort of well-defined is so-called uh, Wiener measure, which, is, which, is, uh, which you can get by integrating out P in the case when H is quadratic in P. So that's uh, more or less uh, understood and defined. But here I'm, I insist on working with loops in the phase space. And that's a slightly more intricate uh, object. Uh, so in particular, so if the, the Wiener measure, it is uh, concentrated on the loops which are continuous, not, not differential, but, but continuous. This measure, the naive at least, the definition, if you try to lift the Wiener measure from the loops and configuration space to the loops in the phase space, it will not be supported on, on, on even on continuous loops. These will be loops which, for which, for every point on the loop, you can either define its position or coordinate, but not both. Uh, in a I mean, there's no measure. There's a lot of central discussion, but it's not that there's actual It's a symbol. It's a symbol. Which, uh, now, what we want to dis dis so we want to discuss is that whatever this symbol is, if I can think of it as of a restriction on the space of real loops of a holomorphic 
top form on the complexification of that space, then I can view this integral as a period over a uh, top degree form with exponential uh, prefactor in a complex space. So this is the So it's an integral of a middle dimensional cycle of the form of the of the type uh, So this is the cycle where it's a cycle in the space of loops valued in the complexification of the phase space and so p uh, superscript c is now uh, it's a complex symplectic manifold. And uh, I'm not saying anything. <laughs> so uh, since this is infinite dimensional, even when this is finite dimensional, it's not there's not much restriction in, 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 in insisting on that. But what I'm going to say next will assume this is not only finite dimensional, but in fact, an algebraic integrable system. So if PC is an algebraic integrable system, <laughs> namely, there is a, there is a, it's a, it's a Lagrangian vibration over some base over, uh, with generic fibers being a billion varieties, principally polarized abelian varieties, then uh, we can say something. P, P sub C. And H is one of the Hamiltonian. It's, uh, it's a, and H descends, uh, uh, so H is a f descends from a function on B. So H, so H, first of all, analytically, the analytic continuation of H was defined on P. We analytically continue it to P sub C is a holomorph to holomorphic function. So H uh, is a restriction of uh, restriction on P of, of some holomorphic function. Holomorphic and induced, so it's a pullback uh, uh, of some function H from the base to C. What is W? And W is uh, this thing, but now written in terms of the holomorphic coordinates. So it's an analytic intonation of, of this action. So W is the functional in the space of complexified loops, which is given essentially by the same formula. <coughs> so W is I integral PDQ minus beta integral H of P and Q. So again, my loop is parameterized by the real parameter, which goes from 0 to 1, but it takes values in the complexified space. So the complexification takes, takes, takes place for the target of my loop, but not for the source. And now when you, uh, so this, uh, such an integral, you can formally expand with some multiplicities is a sum of the periods of the same uh, form over the cycles which are defined so the, the cycles which are uh, which form the basis uh, in the relative homology group of my space of uh, complexified loops relative to the locus where the real part of this expression goes to minus infinity. So this is where, the, in, if this were a fine dimensional case, this is where would you would normally want the uh, endpoints of your counter 
to go to. You want it to go to infinity along, along the sectors where the real part of the exponent goes to minus infinity. So, and so there is a way to choose this, this, this basis given by Lefsch symbols, which is uh, you start at a critical point. So, okay. So one way, a way to choose is to fix the Hermitian metric on the space of complexified loops. And then take the uh, union, and then uh, so fix the Hermitian matrix, fix a critical point of W, and then take a union of descending gradient trajectories. That is solutions of the equation x dot equals the gradient of the real part w over h bar uh, minus. So I want the value of the real part to decrease along the trajectory. So I start at some critical point and go off in all possible directions where my real part uh, decreases. And so that, that union of these trajectories will define in the generic situation, these trajectories will go off to infinity. If you're unlucky, they actually may hit another critical point, but that's, that's a very uh, non-generic situation, so we'll perturb a little bit the metric to avoid that. And so that will be uh, the counter over which my integral will be uh, defined. And then uh, the original integral, which was not uh, defined relative to any specific critical point, will be some linear combination of this, uh, of this con of these periods. So the problem which I want to analyze uh, and say something about it, about it is to just enumerate the possible left symbols, that is to say enumerate the possible critical points. And what's important is to, re to realize that these critical points, these are the critical points in the space of loops on the complexified space. So. Yes, so we will, f we will find that even though this space is infinite dimensional, the critical points, uh, well, actually, they first of all isolated generically, and they can be, uh, if you like, described in, in, in finite dimensional terms. So I will, uh, more precisely, so the, for the, um, if, if my, sp if P, is finite dimensional, then uh, the space of critical points, in fact, uh, so for, for, for P, which is the, the algebraic integral system, the critical points will actually be identified with, with some points on the base B, which I will characterize. And uh, the, the topic of my talk is actually the extrapolation of these ideas to the infinite dimensional case when P itself is infinite dimensional, where it is uh, the uh, space of loops in, uh, in some finite dimensional space. And in that case, uh, together with Igor Krichever, we found that even though, of course, that problem was infinite dimensional by itself, but you can sort of appro approximate the space of critical points by the increasing by the set of critical points uh, uh, sitting in the finite dimensional spaces. So, but it's sort of, uh, I, I, I don't know whether it's a projective or inductive limit, but it's, uh, so it's some kind of uh, uh, infinite flag. But let me finish first with, with, the, with the finite dimensional model case, and then we'll proceed with the infinite dimensional case. So in this case, what happens, so what we are doing, we are, we are, so the critical points of this functional W are the periodic, periodic or twisted periodic solutions 
of, the, of Hamilton equations, except that these equations have a subtle modification. So there is a prefactor of i, and there is beta in here. So these are so these are solutions of Hamilton equations. Albeit, they are sort of aimed in the, uh, at some angle in the complexification of the phase space. If you take if you take the simplest case, uh, the simplest example is that of a particle in a double well potential, where the Hamiltonian is the sum of a kinetic term and the quartic. Uh, polynomial, let's say with the Z2 symmetry, so here the symmetry group is, uh, is a reflection, X by reflecting P and Q to minus P minus Q. The corresponding solutions so of course, in classical mechanics, you know how to solve the equations uh, of motion for the particle and its potential. And you typically get some solutions which will oscillate between, uh, so around one of the minima, if the energy is sufficiently small, or it may be they will oscillate in a, in a kind of a big way. But when you look at the solutions of these equations, they actually look slightly different. They, they look like combinations of the classical motion and tunneling and then classical motion and tunneling back. So this is, so this, this is what the solutions look like. And in terminology of, uh, uh, of physics, these are nonlinear superpositions of instantons and anti-instantons. So these are smooth solutions, which uh, for some period of time t look like instantons. Then they look like classical motion, classical oscillations. And then they look like anti-instantons, and then again, classical motion. But in order to, to really understand what this solution is, you need to go to the fully complexified phase space where the, and look at the level sets of the Hamiltonian. So this is now the energy, the base here is the is where the energy takes values and so for for generic value of the energy the fiber namely the set of p and q for which h of p and q is equal to a constant e is essentially an elliptic curve you need to add two points to make it a compact elliptic curve and so the motion is simply the straight line motion So it's a, it's a rational, it's a, it's a winding, not, not, not necessarily a rational winding, it's a winding on, on this elliptic curve. So we are interested in the solutions which are periodic or twisted periodic. So let me write this for the periodic case. So we need this winding. must be rational <laughs> for, the, for the trajectory to close. So you, you want this to, to, so to obey this condition. So, so the general motion is the image of R mapped to the phase space. So for generic value of the energy functional, if you uh, go from the PQ coordinates to the action angle variables. So 
So the action variable being essentially the integral PDQ over one of the of the cycles on the elliptic curve. So you have the choice. You have a choice of, of cycles for to def define this uh, variable. The corresponding angle variable is defined relative to this choice. So the phi. So it, with, with my choice, the phi. Uh, will have period 2 pi along the A cycle. And then it will be 2 pi times some function of the energy uh, for the B cycle. So that's the modular parameter of that elliptic curve. It's a complicated function of E. So generically, the motion is, uh, so it's always a linear, linear motion in phi variable. So phi of t is phi of 0 plus t times the derivative of the uh, Hamiltonian with respect to the action variable. So you need to in invert, invert this relation. So this is I of E. So in general, when T changes by 1, this guy doesn't go back to itself. And only for special values of E, which are this, the critical points. So, so if E is special, uh, so the special meaning that the period of the differential dq over p over some cycle gamma, so gamma uh, okay, let me call it c time being. So c is the level set Of of uh, of the Hamiltonian. As usual, uh, you, you can so you, you you pick some observation point, make a choice of a basis in the first homology of the fiber of that over that point, and then you can extend it by gauss manning connection up to the uh, monodromy to the to all all of the uh, all of the base. And so, for each cycle. For each choice of a cycle here, you may look for the, uh, you may look for the um, set of points on the base for which this period will be equal to the uh, to beta. So, the, so this is uh, sorry, uh, there's a beta in front of, of my, my equation. So, this i beta i times beta. So this equation, so that equation gives me a set of solutions which depend on the choice of the homology cycle. And so that's, that's the set of critical points of my uh, original functional. So even though this functional was defined in the space of loops, the end result is formulated in fine dimensional terms. Albeit, you have a discrete infinite choice of this homology cycle. And so these solutions, they form a kind of a, a cone. Uh, it's, they don't form a lattice. So you, naively, would, you would think that you, you have a, uh, the lattice worth of choices for gamma. But in fact, because of the monodromy, so there are some uh, singular fibers where my elliptic curve degenerates. And so when, if you go around the singular fibers, the, the cycle gamma undergoes monodromy. And so you don't get a new solution. So some of the solutions are redundant. Uh, but um, you, can describe them, you can describe them quite explicitly for, for large beta. So when beta goes to infinity, so when beta goes to infinity, uh, so gamma is approximately a pair of integers. So what you need to do, you need to look at the uh, uh, fiber which corresponds to the level zero energy level. So this is exactly the classical minimum of the energy. So when, when energy is equal to zero, this curve, as you can see, degenerates to a rational curve. So, so this is because you can solve for p. Uh, 
And so the motion on that degenerate curve is what usually is called instanton or anti-instanton, depending on the choice of the branch, plus or minus. But, when b but uh, these are not actually the actual solutions, because if beta is not e equal to infinity, but it's just very large, then the solutions are close to the solutions. Uh, so the elliptic curve on which a solution is, is moving is not, it's not the degenerate one. It's just, it's just close to the degenerate one. So it, and so on that close, so this is over e equals to 0, and this is over e sub uh, m comma n. So my nomenclature here would be the following, that near the degenerate fiber, there is a preferred element in the homology, namely the vanishing cycle. So that cycle is, is well defined. Let me call it a, the A cycle. The dual cycle, the B cycle, is not uniquely defined. It's defined up to an integer multiple of the A cycle. So in these two numbers, one number will be well defined, but the other number will be defined up to, so n will be defined up to the addition of an integer multiple of m. So, that, so this my cycle gamma is m times b plus n times uh, a, and so if I shift b by twice a, I will not. I don't have time to explain why it's twice. Then uh, my number n will shift by 2m, but the number m will not change. In other words, gamma. So m is defined as the intersection of gamma with the a cycle, which is well defined. So uh, then. For the actual value of the energy for which for you have a solution for this, which will be the, the rational winding representing that, that very cycle is equal to, so it is exponential minus uh, beta omega zero divided by m times the root of unity. And so the, the fact that n is defined up to the addition of the twice m is precisely the fact that you don't, so that's, uh, it's all information you need to define the root of unity. If you shift n by twice m, you go back to the same the point. So that's the structure of, uh, of the solution in this case. And, uh, Omega zero is determined by the uh, by the date of the of the potential. So omega zero squared. Yes. So so omega zero is the frequency of a classical classical motion near near the critical point of the potential. And these guys are the critical points. So they determine the critical points of that functional. So these are the loops, which which these are big loops. So unlike floor theory, which many people here are the experts of where you normally study the critical points of that functional, for which the critical points are just constant loops, which can be anywhere in the phase space. Once you add the Hamiltonian, the picture changes sort of drastically. The, sp the space of critical points becomes isolated, and they're not located anywhere on the phase space, but they, 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 they occupy some special positions. And these are typically big loops. So it is harder to find them but on the other hand, once you found them, the analysis becomes easier because now you have isolated critical points. And many uh, operators you have to deal with are de non-degenerate. So that's, that's useful. OK, so now I want to, right. So, so this, um, maybe just one last thing I want to say that this condition can be generalized to the case of a general algebraic integrable system. And uh, the set of critical points so for, for general algebraic integrable system so P 
sub c omega and the base in the projection um, so uh, so for each cycle gamma If I mark a point and the base corresponding to a non-singular fiber and choose the cycle in the fiber in the, in the fiber over that point, I'll define a, fu a function f sub gamma on B to C. More precisely, it's a function on some cover of the complement to the uh, set of singular fibers. In other words, you can actually put gamma as a part of the data entering, the, uh, defining this cover. So f sub gamma is essentially the period of d inverse omega along the cycle gamma. So that's d inverse. The period of d inverse omega is well defined on the cover. By itself, it's not well defined, but on the cover, it's defined. Minus uh, the Hamiltonian, which now viewed as the minus little h. Remember, uh, Remember my, my uh, so h is a function on the base. So this is a function on, <coughs> on the base, essentially, and the critical points of that function are the critical points in one-to-one -one correspondence with the critical points of w on the space of loops on the complexified phase space. So this is the infinite dimensional problem, and now this becomes a finite dimensional prob problem. The next step, which one might try to take, is to approximate the Lefschetz thimble on the infinite dimensional space of loops in the complexified space by the Lefschetz thimble for that superpotential f sub gamma on the finite dimensional base. And that work has not been done. By approximating, I mean that replacing the integral the infinite dimensional integral by the infinite integral over the finite dimensional left symbol times the Gaussian integral over the infinite dimensional space of, it, of, of the transfer space, which you can then define using zeta regularization. So that should give some approximation to the full answer. Uh, that would be interesting to study, but has not been studied yet. So uh, I want to find, so now we want to, to go to the more interesting case of quantum field theory. So, so far this was the problem in quantum mechanics. And now I want to discuss quantum field theory and try to find a similar structure there. And ideally, we would like to see the loops which we had in the quantum mechanical case. So let's go from one dimensions to two-dimensional problem. So the circle will become now a two-dimensional torus. And so uh, ideally, the uh, critical points of the complexified action should correspond to the uh, linear maps now of the two-dimensional torus to some abelian variety. So this is a kind of high-dimensional analog of uh, what we had here, where we had where the solutions of the quantum mechanical problem, the solutions of the problem of finding left symbols for the quantum mechanical problem uh, be became the problem of finding the rational windings on the abelian variety, which is the same thing as the linear maps of S1 to the uh, corresponding torus. Finding dimensional abelian variety. Finding dimensional abelian variety. To some. some. So, some solutions, yes? so uh,
I think, uh, yes, let's say, so the, uh, so even if uh, your abelian variety in question is actually infinite dimensional, the image of a, uh, I don't know if, it's, if, it, if it can always be proven that the image will, be, will fit into some finite dimensional subtorus, but at least a dense, dense set of solutions will be of that form. So you can always slightly, slightly deform uh, your lattice and make it uh, fit in the fine dimensional subspace. Uh, at any rate, we uh, so uh, unlike the fine dimensional case where this description was exhausting all solutions, in the case of quantum field theory, we'll be we'll, we'll be happy if we can at least find the sufficiently dense set of solutions. So almost all solutions. So the problem for which I want to, to study this is the problem of the ON model. So this is the sigma model describing the maps of the Riemann surface into a sphere. So we study maps and uh, so the sphere with a round metric and so the sphere has a symmetry ON which is why this model historically is called the ON model. Now for n equals to 3 the target space accidentally is, all, is a projective space, a CP1. And among uh, harmonic, all harmonic maps, there are maps which minimize the action in the given topological class, which are instantons or anti-instantons, that is holomorphic or anti-holomorphic maps. And those uh, have been studied most extensively. But in some sense, these are misleading, misleading solutions because uh, as long as, as the, min the minute you take n greater than 3, there is no topology to support uh, these maps. Yet the theory is uh, uh, believed to be in the same universality class. And uh, moreover, they, uh, I mean, what we know about these models is, is we, we, we know best in the limit, so best studied. in the limit and goes to infinity where there are no instantons. Of course, you can take a very special solution where the map lands in a particular sphere, two-dimensional sphere sitting inside Sn mi mi minus 1, but uh, those will, will form a very thin subspace of maps, and those will be unstable, of course. So. Uh, so we want to have a more general class of solutions, which in some sense should, again, glue, uh, interpolate in a, a kind of a smooth way between instantons and anti-instantons, uh, just like uh, we had in the quantum mechanical example. So if I view my sphere as a quadric inside Rn, then uh, the action describing my, my theory can be viewed simply as the action describing the maps to the uh, ambient vector space plus the uh, constraint term, Lagrange multiplier imposing this constraint. Or, if you like, you can solve the equation of motion for, for the auxiliary variable u, solve the, uh, for one variable x in terms of the others, and then substitute here and get the usual non-linear non sigma model action uh, where mn will now, sorry, uh, a, b, where a and b go between 1 and n minus 1. 
So where g is the uh, round metric on the sphere written in some local coordinates y. So uh, instead we will use that formalism with Lagrange multiplier. The advantage of that formalism is that the equations of motion for x are linear. So here, uh, yeah. But of course, you need to, among all solutions of this equation, you need to s find those which obey the constraint. And in particular, it will imply that the potential u in this formula is expressed through the solution itself. So this is uh, the example of a so-called self-consistent Schrodinger equation. We solve the equation. So, so the equation for x is formally the two-dimensional Schrodinger equation with Laplacian and some potential. But then the potential has to be related to the solution itself. Um, another famous example of such model is a nonlinear Schrodinger system in which the potential is the absolute value square of the wave function, uh, which occurs in nonlinear optics, for example. Now, whether, where in this problem are inter algebraic integral systems? Well, one example, we, we can start with, with an example which actually happens to be the first ever example of an algebraic integral system. Namely, among all possible solutions, you can, f you can look for those which have a very simple uh, space dependence. So if my torus S1 cross S1, let's say it has time direction and the space direction, let me call it phi, uh, we can introduce an ansatz in which, um, so let me first uh, introduce another variable, set of variables, x plus minus, we call it y plus minus, sorry, z plus minus a. <coughs> These variables are slightly more convenient to work with, especially if we impose twisted boundary conditions. And so we can introduce the ansatz in which these variables z plus minus of phi and t have essentially have a very simple uh, phi dependence. So some phase theta, phi plus minus, <coughs> and then some function little z of t. So geometrically, what this map is, it maps the, uh, the uh, source circle into the, into the arc in the sphere. It's a geodesic arc. Uh, for generic thetas, this will correspond to twisted boundary conditions, where uh, ZA of plus minus phi plus 2 pi equals into the pl two plus, uh, plus minus 2 pi i theta A. So this is, uh, so that means <coughs> twisted boundary conditions. But of course, if thetas are integers, then th this will correspond to periodic boundary conditions. Yet the solution is non-trivial. So these are the solutions in which, for th integer thetas, these are the solutions in which my uh, wall sheet is a string which winds around a um, uh, big circle in the, in the target sphere. And then this circle somehow moves coherently in time. So then you can substitute this ansatz into the equations of motion. And you'll find that this variable z, now they depend only on time, so it becomes a classical mechanical system. <coughs> they obey the so-called Neumann uh, classical Neumann mechanical system. So these are, this is a system of harmonic oscillators. With frequencies uh, theta. So I put here n over 2. If n is odd, then uh, this are, so you, one of the variables is separate. For, for this variable, <coughs> you just assume it does not depend on phi. 
And so it's a system of oscillators together with this constraint that they, 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 uh, they should sit on a sphere. So this is a system of, from the 19th century. And uh, you can find its solution in Mumford's book on uh, uh, Tata Lectures on Theta. So this is the example of a system which, whose motion linearizes on the Jacobian of some algebraic curve. And in modern terms, we can realize it as a particular case RT case of Godin system, namely, so it's a it's a Hitchin system on G, in Gino zero with um, n over two punctures at theta squared. So you have the, so the, uh, the curve will be happy elliptic, yes. The, the, um, that's why it's in Mumford books, because it's, the, it's where you can describe the, it's the simplest case when you can describe the Jacobian variety kind of explicitly. Uh, algebraically, algebraically. Mm -hmm. Which, which, which two quadrics? So here I have only one quadric. But this is a Lagrangian. It's, it's not an energy. It's, it's, so z dot is an independent variable. It's a difference. Well, maybe, 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 it's, maybe it's related. Actually, I don't know. So here, by the hyperliptic curve, which I'm talking about, is a spectral curve for, for the Higgs field, meromorphic Higgs field, which has. Um, So phi of z, which has a form <coughs> where phi a are interesting. So these are matrices of um, with vanishing eigenvalues of the form z a z a dot z squared z dot squared minus z a uh, z a dot. So the claim is that the time evolution for this system will preserve the uh, eigenvalues of that operator. So the motion, so t evolution is linear on the Jacobian of the curve determinant of phi of z minus lambda is equal to zero. So this is a speckle curve for, for that for this operator. So it's a huge, it's a um, this is not a regular this is not a regular example of Hitchin system because the the singularity at infinity is not a simple pole. But other than that, uh, it's a familiar, familiar problem. And so uh, here, the corresponding map of a two-dimensional torus into the Jacobian collapses, actually. So we have, since, we re so since this ansatz reduces the two-dimensional problem to the one-dimensional one, we only see uh, the one-dimensional uh, winding. But, but then, uh, so then, in, in a sense, the problem is uh, reduced to the problem we, we discussed. So again, you have a algebraic integral system, and the condition for the, uh, of, uh, the choice of a fiber is determined by the fact that the time evolution becomes a rational winding on the, on the abelian variety. What about more general solutions? So these are found by thinking of the of this uh, equation as of the, uh, uh, so you want to uh, associate to the Schrodinger potential. So first you, 
kind of relax the condition that the, the potential is, uh, is expressed through the solution, just so temporarily forget about this condition. Just think about the general Schrodinger operator on the torus. And that's uh, given the potential. So u is a periodic function, which I now allow to be complex. Again, we complexify everything because we're looking for Lefschetz symbols. We don't expect the solution to be real. So now allow all the variables to be uh, complex valued. And therefore, the potential u also uh, may become complex valued, but still, I still want it to be periodic. Now, the solutions uh, in this problem will be ultimately interested in the quasi periodic solutions, uh, namely, so if I impose. some twisted boundary conditions when G and H, uh, the orthogonal matrices, possibly complexified orthogonal matrices, I'm using, of course. So we want the solution to be uh, twisted periodic. We have G and H, and uh, again, if, uh, you can <coughs> sort of diagonalize the orthogonal matrices by going to the basis uh, which I used before, the Z plus minus So this is the basis where G and H are Diagonal matrices. So, um, so now the condition is that z plus minus phi two plus pl phi plus two pi is equal to g a to the power plus minus one and z a plus minus of t plus beta is equal to h to the power plus minus one, where g and h. Uh, some non-zero complex numbers. So if my, again, if capital N is odd, then this diagonalization will force, f uh, will uh, uh, have one of the eigenvalues will have to be equal to plus minus one. So for one of the, for the remaining variable, uh, I will not form a linear combination, I'll just use the coordinate itself. So, uh, Now the idea is to look at the uh, collection of, of these solutions, which have these properties, and observe that as a function of little a and the choice of the sign, they actually all fit into a single analytic object. Namely, so they depend on, uh, so they, they, they all f Form a, they all solve the same Schrodinger equation, but they depend on an auxiliary parameter, we call it zeta, which be, leaves, leaves on some curve to some analytic curve. And for special values of zeta, We'll get, uh, so psi will specialize to z a plus minus. So that's the idea. So this is some kind of a twister twister uh, correspondence in uh, in gauge theory. When people study instantons, you can form uh, out of the components of the gauge field. You can form some linear combination of these components depending on the auxiliary parameter, and that. 
uh, new object will describe a holomorphic bundle on the on a space which has one complex dimension higher than, than the original space time. So here we are doing something like that. Um, so, so we introduce an auxiliary uh, curve and we look for, for, the, for, for, a, for an analytic object which will be uh, called the, the baker hazer function on that curve with certain properties which, will, which I will now specify. Now, uh, so let's just look at the model example where uh, u is a constant. Suppose u, uh, this, is not, this is not a reali realistic example, but it's a good example to start with. And so then the solutions of this equation can be easily written down explicitly. So indeed, they depend on auxiliary parameter zeta. So zeta is a choice of a quasi-momentum. So z and z bar here are the holomorphic coordinates on my world sheet. So I identify the, the S1 cross S1 with the elliptic curve with some um, complex structure uh, parameter tau. So these solutions, these are plane wave solutions of the uh, uh, klein gordon equation in two dimensions. So these solutions are quasi-periodic. As I shift, as I shift uh, z by 1 or tau, They are multiplied by by some uh, block multipliers. And so this the union, so you can so the union of this uh, solutions. Uh, inside the modular space of uh, C star flat connections on, on the torus form, an, form a curve. So it's a curve which is parameterized by zeta, therefore it's, it's sort of uniform, uniformized by the uh, by a, by a complex uh, line, so it's a, it's a rational curve, but its image has an infinite number of double points. And so the, inside that space, that curve looks like uh, some kind of a lattice. And so these double points, so this is inside uh, C star cross C star, the space which parameterizes the Floquet, block Floquet uh, multipliers. And so these double points, they are parameterized by the points of a two-dimensional lattice without an origin. Namely, you can find, for every pair of integers m and n, you can find two values of zeta, which are, dif which are different from each other, but for which the values of corresponding a and b multipliers are, are equal. So it means that zeta plus plus u0, zeta plus inverse, is equal to zeta minus plus u0 zeta minus inverse uh, plus 2 pi i times an integer i, and the same for the second multiplier with an integer m. So these, are, these will be quadratic equations for zetas, which have two solutions. Now, uh, if your potential u is not a constant, but some perturbation of a constant. So it's some general, general uh, Fourier series, let's say. So these are two exponents. 
for small u, you can analyze the corresponding behavior of that curve by doing just quantum mechanical perturbations theory. And so what you will observe is that the double, the node corresponding the, to the pair m and n will get resolved once you turn on the Fourier mode with, mo with components m n and minus m minus n. So the picture, the local picture, is that. So if that's the node which corresponds to m n, once you have the modes u m n and u minus m minus n present. So if this is locally described by the equation zw equals to zero, it's a double point. Then uh, once you turn on this this uh, Fourier mode, so the potential, the equation, local equation of the curve will will become that. And so the so typically the uh, these double points get get resolved, and the topology the topology of the curve. Uh, sort of reflects the non-triviality of your potential. So uh, depending on how many, how many uh, uh, modes, Fourier modes that your potential has, this curve will have so many handles. Because that now every, every time you do that, you create a little, little cycle on the curve. Um, so you can ask a reverse question. Suppose you fine-tuned your potential in such a way that you've actually created a finite genus curve. So that meaning that, uh, so once you resolve double points and then went to the normal normalization of the curve, so the, 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 so typically you'll have still an infinite number of double points, but those you just get rid of by going to normalization. So whether the result will be a finite genus algebraic curve, what can you say about the potential? And so such potential is called a finite gap potential. And these were. Not anymore. So, so, it, so it, it was on the rational curve for the, uh, for the constant potential. Now zeta just parameterizes the solutions of this equation, which, which, which are, which are not, not anymore, not anymore. So, so for given, given the potential, so, you, so the, that's, that's, the, that's the thing. So given the potential u, which is some double periodic function, maybe with some restriction on the growth of Fourier modes, you define a curve, which is a normalization of the set of um, No, no, it's just the same notation, but it's uh, in the, uh, I mean, uh, this is a, it's, I don't know what's the connection of that to some formulas in, in gauge theories where you have a third term in the expo exponent, which indeed uh, has something to do with hypercal structure. Whether this guy has anything to do with hypercal structure, I don't know. And it, I, it's unlikely because, you see, on hypercalic manifolds, the space which parameterizes the local complex structures is all is always is always a CP1. But in this business, once you pass from the once you uh, your Schrodinger potential is uh, some generic function, the the uh, curve which parameterizes the solutions is no longer uh, rational. It's a uh, it's very high genus curve. The normalization, normalization of the curve. So, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to take that curve with infinite number of double points as my curve. I will, I will go to normalization. I needed that curve as a starting point of my discussion, because what I was trying to, what I was explaining was that once you turn on the potential, double points get resolved, and once they're resolved, the normalization doesn't do anything. So C sub u is a normalization of the set of A and B such that uh, there exists a solution of this equation such that psi of z plus 1 equals A psi, psi of z plus tau is equal to B of z. 
So we call this a Fermi curve. This is not the precise definition, it's, a, it's, a, it's an approximation of the precise definition. There are some refinements which I will skip because, uh, and probably over time. What, what's, my, what's my time limit? Minus five. Minus five, okay, I'll, <laughs> I'll conclude. Uh, so, so, um, so there is a way to characterize the set of potentials uh, for which the corresponding curve will have a finite genus and for which you can find the cell consistent, for which the potential will be consistent. That is to say that it will be expressed in terms of s the values of the solutions at the special points. So these are uh, the curves with additional structure involving the involution. And uh, so there is a, uh, there's an involution which generalizes the involution zeta goes to minus zeta. These curves have two special points, p plus and p minus, which are kind of the descendants of the points z equals to zero and z equals infinity, where that solution was purely holomorphic or anti-holomorphic. So that structure persists for general C. It's C hat. Uh, so this is actually going to be C hat. Uh, so, C, so there is a curve with involution sigma, which generalizes that. And uh, we require that we, we fix a meromorphic differential d omega on the curve C, which is a quotient of C hat by the involution. So the involution should be such that it has only two fixed points. So C hat sigma is P plus and P minus. So d omega is a differential with uh, with poles exactly two for sort of poles at p, at points p plus and p minus. And uh, so it has some number of uh, so this is a quotient curve. So it has some number of zeros. Which, which has to be exactly 2G. So G is a genus of C. And so the, cho the data which, which you, uh, uh, which parameterize the solution involves a choice of a pre-image for each pre-image on the curve C hat of, uh, of the zeros, one of the, one of the pre-images, gamma S. And so then, uh, by this data, we define the baker archaeizer function as a function which has a spe specified uh, essential singularity at the points p plus, p minus, which, which is modeled on, on this solution, and has si simple poles at the points gamma s. And by these conditions, it is determined uniquely and can be actually written explicitly in terms of theta functions. And then there is additional structure involving a choice of a meromorphic function with exactly n poles, that uh, will specify the position, the, the values of gamma at which you evaluate the baker archaeizer function to get the solutions. So that actually works in the case when capital N is uh, even, and for N odd it's more complicated and so probably should be the subject of another talk. Thank you very much. So they, uh, as far as I know, everything that Witten does concerns the case when h is equal to zero. So it's a kind of highly non-interesting case from the point of view of physics. It might be interesting for, for, for the applications to not. So they, that work was aimed to explain why Jones invariants are essentially polynomials in Q, which is uh, quite non-trivial from the point of view of Chen Simon's definition of this invariance which are expansions in 1 over k, and q is exponential of 2 pi i over k. So it's some, uh, so that, that, that's why, uh, I mean, that's a program that Witten undertook, which also involves analytic continuation, complexification of phase space, and, and doing all that. In fact, I mean, we, we sort of grew out of s some related work we were doing together, 
uh, involving the relation between gauge theories and integrable systems. Uh, so it's a different it's a different branching of that of that problem. I mean, I should probably advertise. So, so of course, the theory of periods is a big subject, and you'll probably hear on Saturday from Baranikov about the non-commutative period. So, you see, what? Oh, that's talk. Okay, perfect. Uh, so, you see, one of the things which people try to do for hundred years is to give the definition of this path integral such that it reproduces what expect what's expected on different grounds, namely that the expectation values of observables defined using that integral are actually non they depend on the order in which you write these observables. And so some people try to insert non commutativity inside this integral. So maybe that's what uh, Sergey will talk about. Okay. Thank you.